Hello everyone and welcome to another Explorers Month. Um, this for today we are gonna do something called the Armchair Traveler. Um, this again this um, this concept came about because of COVID nineteen. But before I explain what is uh, Armchair Traveler, maybe it's a good time for me to uh, introduce who we are, what are we doing. Um, so my name is Jay. I am sort of like just the uh, the sideline guy, sidekick of today. Uh, the main star is actually over here. I'll, I'll introduce him in just a second. And uh, I'm from an organization called Intercultural Education. So in case you don't know, it's all about making people become uh, global citizens. Um, and the armchair traveler came about because uh, during the pandemic, people cannot travel. And uh, we were thinking like, oh, what about using another way of traveling? What about uh, using things like Google Earth? Uh, but let's not stop there, right? Let's have someone who is from that country to be the tour guide to share with us some uh, secrets or little known places, uh, you know, less touristy spots. Uh, and, and, um, and that's how the whole armchair traveler came about, right? But uh, this month, we are focusing on uh, the beautiful country of uh, Egypt, <laughs> um, well known for, um, well, the, well known for the pyramids. Right, uh, but today we'll probably not talk about the the pyramids, um, and uh, it's also been uh, in the news lately with um the very famous uh, Swiss Canal incident. <laughs> so a lot of memes came about. Um, so today I think it's a very good. It's a very. Oh, uh, did I say something wrong? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah. Sure. Um. So today will be. I, I. We just thought it would be a very interesting uh, uh, and a very fun uh, um, time really to look at this country and learn about like um, the, you know, the whole coming from the history or, or um, what, what are some places that you guys can visit once COVID ends. Uh, they are not so touristy. Uh, that's also a bit uh, uh, interesting. All right. Um, but let's not let me stop the talking and let me introduce to you guys the star for today. And that is Serac. <laughs> Uh, hello everyone, my name is Sarag Heba. I am uh, Egyptian. I'm a year two student at CUHK studying energy and environmental engineering. So today I'm going to be showing you around Egypt a little bit, uh, some armchair traveling. And the way I'm going to be doing it might be a bit unconventional, so I want to be showing you the more, you know, the usual touristic spots. I'll be going for a sort of a different angle and showing you lesser, part, lesser known parts of Egypt. And I want to explain the stories behind these places and why they're significant. Because personally, when I travel, uh, I don't really feel the significance of where I'm going unless I know the story behind it and what made it significant. So that's what I hope to be sharing with you guys today, and I hope you enjoy it. Mm. So the next time, you know, when we are actually in uh, Egypt, we can actually listen again to what Sarah is going to share and have a different uh, perspective, right? That's what we're going to do for today. Hopefully, yep. yeah. Uh, right, before I, <laughs> sorry, I forgot one more thing, um, because this is on YouTube live, right? Um, so if you guys have any questions you would like to ask Serac, um, uh, feel free to type in the comment box, uh, the live chat, I, I'll be monitoring as well. So, um, you know, you feel free to type it there so we can actually ask uh, Serac in real time, right? So uh, again, please, 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 if you want to have uh, any questions or queries about Egypt, about all the points that we will be talking later, Feel free to type in the chat box, mm. right? Yeah, back to you. Yes, thank you. Okay, I guess I'll begin. Uh, but yeah, please do type in the chat box and I might be asking some questions just to get some interaction. So uh, feel free to answer. Uh, actually, please do answer. So that <laughs> I'm not just talking to myself. Um, so like I said, it's going to be unconventional and I chose to start the tour not in Egypt, uh, in London, actually. So perhaps you can guess where we're going. Should we wait for some answers? Um, no, we are going to the British Museum first. Uh, if you've been to the British Museum, you'll know it's huge. It's full of artifacts. Uh, it has history from all around the world, perhaps except for Britain. Um, and it has an entire wing dedicated to it called the Egyptian wing, which is over here, um, this part. And so imagine it's a nice, beautiful day in London. Uh, you're on the roof of the museum for some reason. <laughs> no. Okay, there. Uh, you're entering the museum. You go inside. Okay, and you make your way to the Egyptian wing, which is here on the left. 
and suddenly you're in this room and you're surrounded by you know a whole bunch of egyptian artifacts these are things that are thousands of years old you have these uh statues and these busts and the columns i uh, even have a sarcophagus over here uh really just a whole bunch of stuff and this is how it looks like when the museum is empty uh when it's just a regular day this is much closer to what it actually looks like and you see it's full of people um and so the one thing i really want to point out in this museum uh maybe you'll see it over here uh, so you see this part is also is very busy but also over there there's a lot of people and they're crowding around something and maybe we can get a closer look not this side this side there we go uh let me zoom in so you might have seen this before if you're uh watching and commenting uh you can guess what this is it's called the rosetta stone and this is actually the most visited artifact in the entire british museum uh it's egyptian it was made around 200 BC, so a little over 2,000 years ago. And it's really, really important um, because essentially what it is, it's a message from the king of the time, whose name was Ptolemy V. Um, and it's written in three different languages. So you'll see on the top, uh, this, these are just hieroglyphics. Here on the bottom is another script called uh, Demotic, which was an ancient Egyptian script that was more common for everyday use. And on the bottom is Ancient Greek. So around the time that this was discovered, people knew about the existence of ancient Egyptians. Of course, they could see the pyramids and the tombs and, you know, the hieroglyphics. But they had no idea what any of that actually meant because they had no idea how to decipher this language. Uh, so they couldn't tell who was what and what was the significance of what they were seeing. So it wasn't until the Rosetta Stone was discovered that they were actually able to crack this code and the whole field of Egyptology began. Because you see here, ancient Greek was a language that people knew how to understand and read and write and even speak. So using this uh, ancient Greek script, they were able to translate this. So I'll speak a little bit about the story of the Rosetta Stone. So where was it found? It was found in the city of Rosetta. Uh, in Arabic, it's called uh, Rashid. Rosetta is like, I don't know, the Western name they give to it. So welcome to Egypt. This is our first stop. Uh, it's just a small city called Rashid, maybe uh, not very old, I think a few hundred years. Um, and it's special for two reasons. The first reason is that it sits on one of the Nile's two branches, uh, which you'll see here. Uh, the other branch of the Nile is more eastward in the country. And the second reason why it's very special and important is because this is where the Rosetta Stone was found. It wasn't found in the main city, but it was found more this that no, this direction, which is yes, in a fort that was nearby. Um, there we go. It's over here. This fort was built by the Ottomans around 400 years ago, and in 1799, Napoleon decided to invade Egypt. Uh, and they used this fort also as an outpost. And while they were uh, renovating the fort, I guess, or, you know, making it better, uh, they found the Rosetta Stone. So, so uh, the Rashid is actually um, next to River Now, that famous River Now that floods every yes. year. Exactly. It sits on the western uh, branch of the River mm -hmm. Nile. Um, and so it's built right next to it as sort of a way to guard uh, Egypt from the north because uh, it's also near the Mediterranean Sea. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it was found, the Rosetta Stone was found uh, in this fort in 1799. And so what's interesting is that the French, they invaded Egypt in 1799. Uh, and by almost all measures, it was a complete disaster because they left literally three years later in 1802. Um, but scientifically, it was considered a victory. They found the Rosetta Stone. They were able to find so many different Egyptian artifacts. They were able to map Egypt for the first time and really create this entire new field. But then what happened was uh, the British came and the British mm, defeated the French and they forced the French to leave. And before the French could leave, they asked them to hand over all the stuff they found, including the Rosetta Stone, actually. So people say that the British stole the Rosetta Stone from Egypt. Actually, I think maybe a more accurate version would be that the French stole it from Egypt and then the British stole it from the French. <laughs> yeah, so this was uh, just a painting of uh, the city of Rosetta around that time. You can see here 1801 to 1803. 
And this is uh, Champollion. He was the person who first translated the Rosetta Stone. And you can see here in his own handwriting, on the left, this is ancient Greek. Uh, in the middle column, you have the Demotic script, and on the right are the hieroglyphic counterparts. So he translated it about 20 to 30 years later, um, which, you know, is, is wonderful, and now we know a lot of things about Egypt. Uh, in 2003, though, Egypt asked to get the Rosetta Stone back from Britain, and Britain said no, and they instead sent us this replica. <laughs> uh, um, so they sent us a replica of our own Rosetta Stone and you can find the replica in the city of Rashid uh, which I showed earlier um, it's actually the city the, the Rashid has a very wonderful museum uh, and has a lot of cool things so if you decide to go to this lesser known part of Egypt you should definitely visit here um, and see these things mm. But the Rosetta Stone actually isn't the only uh, super important stone tablet that is found in Egypt, uh, or was found in Egypt. Uh, you may have heard of another one. Let me zoom out a bit. Um, maybe you can guess. See a comment. Nope. Okay. So here we are in Sinai, specifically in Mount Sinai. Uh, in Arabic, it's called Gabal Musa, uh, which translates to mountain of Moses, I guess. So if you know a little bit about, uh, you know, the Abrahamic religions, uh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, you know that Moses um, came here and in Judaism and Christianity, he received the Ten Commandments, I think. I'm not entirely sure, but he did receive the Ten Commandments uh, according to these religions. And even in Islam, he came to this mountain and God spoke to him. So this is Mount Sinai itself. Uh, it's a very under, not very well known uh, mm. spot in, in Egypt for first time tourists, but definitely, uh, you know, people do come here and you will see some tourists around as well as locals. And it's a really uh, interesting spot in Egypt. So I'll talk a little bit about it. Here is the peak. Nope, that's not it. So the Mount, uh, wait, it's, how to pronounce it again? S Sinai. Sinai. Uh, to me, it's like, a, I mean, for me, like a layman, not from Egypt. Uh, it's, first of all, it's the, um, reminds me of, of course, the, the religious uh, aspect mm. of it. Uh, but also, secondly, it has some uh, historical uh, um, a part of that, right? Especially with the, the war uh, between uh, Israel and Egypt. Mm. Uh, so, so at least that's what I, I would think of when you take a, when you say the word Mount Sinai. Um, so if you are from in the audience, you know, um, you can also let us know, um, if, you know, um, what do you guys think about when you first hear about this uh, Mount Sinai? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. It is. A, it has a huge history, uh, recent history and past. Uh, you know, this story goes back th thousands of years uh, mm -hmm. when Moses first came here. So you can see from the top of this mountain, it, it's not the tallest mountain in the range. Actually, there's a mountain right next to it that's a bit taller. But it still has a very beautiful view from the top anyway. And you can see, you know, a bunch of tourists huddled up wearing their uh, warm clothes. Um, and if you turn around, you'll see this building and this building and the tourists in front of it. So... These two buildings are, well, let's start with this one. This is actually a church. So this is an Orthodox Greek church. Um, and it was built in the 1900s, but it was built on the ruins of an earlier church that was built in the 1500s. That church was built on the ruins of an earlier one built in the 6th century in the 500s. And that one was built on even earlier ruins, <laughs> built in the 400s. <laughs> so this church goes way, way back. Uh, and I'll talk about it more in just a second. But there is also a mosque here. Uh, this is a mosque and it's also extremely old. I think it was built in the 11th century. At least that's the first time where there's a mention of it. Um, so next to the church, yes, here, uh, if you've read maybe uh, the New Testament, one of the holy books, there's a story of uh, Moses climbing up Mount Sinai and fasting, I think for 40 days uh, and 40 nights. Uh, I think that's a version in, in Christianity. And so on this mountain, there are two caves. 
I could only find one of them on Google Earth, unfortunately, and this is one of them. So it said that here is not where he completed his fast, but this is where God uh, gave to him the stone tablets with the Ten Commandments. And it was, the, the stone tablets come from one of these stones over here, actually. Um, in Islam, uh, the story is a little bit different, uh, but it's also related, and I'll talk about it in a second. So near Mount Sinai is also a monastery called St. Catherine's Monastery, um, which has a few fun facts. So first of all, it's its own church, uh, meaning it does not belong to any other denomination. It's not like a, a Catholic, it doesn't belong to like the Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church or even the Coptic Church in Egypt. It's literally its own church. It's called the Church of Sinai. Uh, and it is one of the oldest working uh, monasteries in the entire world. And it has the oldest working, continually working library uh, ever, which I think is quite interesting. And that's is it is it accessible to people now nowadays? Yeah. Or? You mean now like COVID now or? I mean, well, 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 like pre COVID, let's say pre COVID. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You can go there and see oh. all kinds of cool things. So this is how it looks like from the outside. You can see the exterior. You know, looks very grand. These huge walls. Uh, there's some camels right here. Uh, people like to take camels up to Mount Sinai, so I guess if you're coming down with a camel, and if I remember correctly, there's a camel right there. <laughs> yes, <laughs> this is a camel. Um, how about we go inside? Okay, this is what it looks like a little bit closer. And of course, over the years, it's been renovated, so these might not be the original walls, mm. um, but a lot of the structures inside are original, and uh, you can see here some views from the inside. It has many tourists, Egyptians and foreigners alike. Uh, and it also has a native population. So besides the monks and the uh, the monks who live in the monastery, but Sinai in general and uh, the village nearest to this monastery has a local Bedouin population. They usually act as like tour guides. By by uh, by Bedouin, um, do you mean like uh, maybe for people who don't know what is a Bedouin? Okay. Uh, a Bedouin, um, sort of like a nomadic Arab uh, culture. So they're not, uh, they are Arab, but they also have their own sort of subculture. Uh, they go way back to pre-Islamic times. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So it could be like a, almost like an indigenous mm, uh, definitely. tribe, would you say? Or like more yes, like people? So it's not just one tribe, but it's more of like a, uh, yeah, a huge, like different groups of mm. tribes. Okay. Yeah. So this is uh, another view from the inside, mm. and, and all you know, all throughout this uh, monastery are um, different icons and mosaics uh, and depictions of Jesus and of Mary and really old artworks, mm. uh, and it's really wonderful also because you see like here are some gardens and they have trees and they sort of grow their own food, and it's literally right in the middle of the desert and a very mountainous and arid region. So it's a very wonderful place, uh, you know, if you're religious or not, you can sort of see the value in this. Um, it's like its own, it's like its own uh, community and a living uh, space. And definitely, and it's been like that for f like almost 2,000 mm -hmm. years, you know. Uh, people have been living here for an extremely long time. Okay. Oh, I wanted to include this picture because uh, even when you're in the mountains, you're still in Egypt. Egypt is quite hot. This is the sun, of course. <laughs> this is a Bedouin man wearing some sort of traditional clothes. And then over here, a bunch of tourists hiding, <laughs> <laughs> uh, hiding from the sun, uh, which is an interesting note. But actually, what's more interesting than this is the burning bush. So... I think this is also in Christianity, but in Islam, the story goes that when Moses was traveling with his family, escaping uh, uh, the Egyptians, uh, not the big sort of escaping where they sp split the Red Sea and walked in the middle, but earlier when I think he killed an Egyptian man to protect an Israelite, mm -hmm. and then the Pharaoh ordered for him to be killed. So he took his family and escaped. And that is when, at least in the Quran, it says um, he saw a fire. Mm. in the mountain and so he wanted to go to it to get some uh, firewood um, and when he approached he realized it wasn't a fire it was actually a tree and this is the tree uh, or so they say this is the burning bush 
Uh, and again, in Islam, it said that once he approached this tree, God spoke to him and revealed to him that he is a prophet. Um, yes. So this is that famous tree. Yeah, this is the tree. That famous. The picture is a bit zoomed in here. I'm not sure why, mm. but you can see this uh, on the bottom. There's definitely a lot of people, mm. uh, you know, by it and taking pictures of it. Uh, so it's really a very interesting place. But maybe... Oh, what's this? Oh, right. Okay. So these are the <laughs> icons and the mosaics I talked about. Uh, you can see very old and uh, the art style is, is, is quite wonderful. And these depictions uh, are really very beautiful. And it also has this. It's called the oldest Bible in the world. It has the, old, the entire Old Testament and parts of the New Testament written sometime between 330 and 350. Uh, but like, you know, many things in Egypt's... Uh, History, it's no longer in Egypt. It was taken, I think, to Russia or some other place. So you won't be able to see it in Egypt, but I do know that it exists uh, and that it was found in this monastery. Mm -hmm. So the next place you could go maybe after visiting uh, this St. Catherine's Monastery and Mount Sinai, which is over here. Uh, just for reference, this is mainland Egypt. This is Sinai. You could go to Dahab. Uh, Dahab, you know, there's no historical story behind this. Dahab is just like a sea resort. Uh, and I'll show you why it's popular. Because it's by the Red Sea, which is very famous for, you know, wonderful waters and lots of biodiversity and for diving. So lots of people, this is sort of like a hippie town in Egypt. You go, you sit by the beach, uh, you smoke shisha, you dive, I guess. And you do all sorts of. Can I say that? Um, it's a very, it's a very stereotypical touristy, uh, Egypt. Yes, it is. Right. They talk about like. Yeah. So there's like the one stereotype of the whole pyramids and museum and stuff, and then there's this sort of. They're usually like Germans, uh, <laughs> or Ukrainians, and they go to the Red Sea and they have their. Uh, yeah, it's it's super, touristy. Actually, when you go there, the the stores, the signs. They're written in Arabic and Russian. Uh, so not in Arabic or English, for example, uh, like the rest of the country. So it goes to show the demographic of the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. And lots of the locals, uh, local, local Egyptians, they speak Russian there, mm -hmm. just from how much they have to deal with Ukrainian tourists and not deal with, I mean, you know, work alongside <laughs> Russian and Ukrainian tourists. Uh, and so the main reason people come here is actually for the Blue Hole, which is nearby. So this is a really famous diving spot and it's perhaps one of the best diving spots in the world, especially if you factor in the fact that it's easy to get to. Uh, going to Egypt is not difficult and it's not an expensive place. So it's popular among tourists and professionals alike. You can see the view here. So this is the main entrance of the Blue Hole, but there's also like a side entrance maybe over there. Uh, you can see the nearby mountains uh, down here, some cafes, and they also sell diving gear or they rent out diving gear. And over there is something I'll talk about very soon. So, oh yeah, imagine you're sitting here by the sea uh, on a cafe, enjoying some drink, shisha, some shisha, <laughs> yes, and some uh, non-alcoholic beverages uh, before you go diving. But at the same time, it also has a uh, bit of a reputation. So while it is beautiful and you can see here this guy who's free diving uh, in between these rocks and you can see some fish and it's really quite beautiful. It's also known as the Divers Cemetery. Uh, the reason why is because a lot of divers have died here. Uh, the Blue Hole, which I mentioned, is about 100 meters deep. And you can see in this diagram, which I'll be very honest, I don't entirely understand, but it is a complicated, uh, you know, structure there are like sort of caves within the blue hole and there are some uh, sort of like corridors and tunnels. Uh, and so if you don't know what you're doing, it's very easy to get trapped or to go too deep. And then, uh, you know, if you're running on a certain amount of oxygen, you might run out of oxygen, uh, things like that. And even some really famous divers, uh, you can see here, this is an article by The Guardian in 2017. So this was a uh, really famous diver, a professional diver. He died in, uh, d uh, here in 2017. And then you see they call it the underwater cathedral. And I think the reason why is because if you go all the way to the bottom, it has these wonderful uh, structures. So it kind of does look like a cathedral. So yeah, maybe 
don't do that. I mean, go there and enjoy it. Uh, don't necessarily go to the dangerous parts of the blue hole and get yourself killed, but maybe enjoy some of the other parts, like the underwater museum. I remember like uh, um, hearing about this from uh, Reddit actually, uh, just two months ago yeah. regarding the whole. Uh, uh, that's how I actually got to know about the the blue hole, and how uh, I think there was even one person who filmed his own death. Uh, oh. uh, well, sort of like he he he. He his video dropped into the water and then they recover and then they basically they saw the, uh, the whole process. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was a okay. Sorry. Sorry for bringing everything down. <laughs> no, that's okay. It's a bit dark, but uh. <laughs> <laughs> we uh we do have a question from Edwin, but maybe we can uh uh, uh we can address it in a very very short while. Uh, sure. Yeah. Before we move on. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just saying, uh, there's, there's uh some divers a few years ago installed an underwater museum. You see here is like an elephant they made out of some uh, like salvaged uh, material. And there's also some other animals, I guess. Um, yeah. Okay. So do be careful. <laughs> yes. Or else you'll find yourself here. Um, not here. This is just the sea. I mean here. So these are plaques commemorating all the people who have died. Not all of them. I guess the lucky ones who have people to remember them. Um, and you can, you know, zoom in, you can see their names here. Yulia, Yamposka, Sergei, Petrov. Ukraine, Ukraine remembers Ukraine. you. In okay. 2015, uh, some divers who died. Mm -hmm. uh, Stefan Felder? Seems, sounds German, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, and an interesting one I realized yesterday was Karl Marx, 45. Karl Marx? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's different Karl Marx. Probably a different Karl Marx, yes. Uh, so a man by the name of, or a woman, no, a man by the name of Karl Marx, uh, at the age of 45, came diving here and didn't survive. Mm. Um, so you can see it's definitely a notorious spot and, yeah, I mean, go, but be careful. There's a lot of Cyrillic uh, there as well, in the, uh, mm. yeah, in the, in the graves. Uh. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So... So it lives up to the reputation that we were saying, and mostly a lot of like Ukrainians, Russians, and Germans uh, yeah. in, in the area. Uh, some British people as well, and Australians. Um, some Egyptians, this is a nice Egyptian couple. Uh, I don't know, it looks like it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> anyway. Um, so, if we leave Sinai, and mm. want to go back to mainland Egypt. Uh, so maybe before we leave Sinai, uh, we oh, have yeah. a question about Sinai from uh, Edwin. Um, yes. He said, in the Bible, Mount Sinai was described as a volcano, but is this the case in reality? Uh, so it's not a volcano. I don't know what it says in the Bible, but no, Mount Sinai is not a volcano. It's just a mountain. Uh, it's, a, it's just like, okay, yeah, it's just a normal it's just a mountain. mountain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I hope that uh, answers your question, Edwin. <laughs> uh, yeah, feel free to um, you know uh, type in the chat box uh, if you have any any other questions as we move on to mainland Egypt. Mm. Um, yeah, feel, yeah, you can always um, ask us on the live chat. Yes, please. And actually, there's some discussion about what is the real Mount Sinai. So even though this has the name Mount Sinai, some people say no, this isn't actually it. That the biblical Mount Sinai is different. Some I read yesterday, uh, people were claiming that the real one is in Saudi Arabia. Mm. I don't know, that didn't make much sense to me, because if Moses was in Egypt, you know, how's he <laughs> going to get to Saudi Arabia? But um, in any case, if you would like to, if you're in, you know, Dahab, Mount Sinai, you're done with that, and you want to go back to Egypt, you have to cross by uh, the Suez Canal. So this canal was in the news recently. Uh, you probably heard about the ship that got stuck there, or you've seen all the memes. Um, it's actually been stuck many times in its history, maybe about eight times. And... <laughs> It's only been around for... So this Suez Canal, as it is currently, has been around f since 1859, I think. Mm. But actually, there have been canals here dating all the way back to the f uh, Pharaonic Egypt. So thousands mm. of years. Uh, the first canal was built in 2000 BC. It connected the Mediterranean and the Red Sea through the Nile. So I'm guessing probably through the eastern branch of the Nile, which runs this way. Mm. Uh, through another system of canals. Yeah. But anyway, this canal, this uh, current Suez Canal was built in the 1800s. Uh, at the time, Egypt was independent. No, that's not true. Egypt was under Ottoman rule, but it was very much influenced by British and French uh, you know, politics. Mm. And the company that they set up uh, was governed by the British and the French. 
Uh, and this was the case up until 1956, when we'll see here what happened. The Suez Canal, never far from the news in its 87 years of history, hits the headlines like a bombshell. When, without a hint of warning, Egypt's premier, Colonel Nasser, announces that his country is taking it over. The profit is to be used to complete the Aswan Dam, the huge project from which Britain and America recently withdrew their offers of financial aid. Two years ago, Britain agreed to withdraw her troops. The canal would become Egypt's property in 1968. Mr. Anthony Head signed for Britain. So you can Nasser see here, this Egypt. is uh, Gamal bin Nasser, Nasser, the first the uh, president up. of Egypt, the canal, he says, Egypt is as a republic, after forthwith. it was no longer in monarchy. Will be paid current stock exchange prices. Uh, the interesting man, very controversial. The annual profit will become uh, Egyptian about him just a second. Dressed in his military Britain uniform, he was a military leader pact. as well. She withdrew the troops which had guarded for so long this most vital of the world's waterways. No sooner had the last so British like soldier gone than NASA triumphantly no, hoisted the, the Egyptian flag over the canal zone base. Exactly, in uh, 1956. Now he has the canal itself they nationalized it actually in July 26, 1956. she is not only the main shareholder, yeah. but uh, also the Which was main on the user. fourth anniversary Egyptian of Egypt's crowds enthusiastically uh, independence acclaim NASA. from Britain. But Egypt's arbitrary action has provoked a major crisis. Well, unofficially. <laughs> so Egypt got its independence from Britain twice, kind of. Uh, in 1919, they sort of said, okay, we'll leave you alone. But in 1952, when the king left, that's when actually Egypt came to its independence. Um, so you can, you know, if you heard the commentator, this was, uh, this is obviously an old video. The news reporter is British. And when I uh, listened to it, I got the impression that it's a bit biased, to be honest. I mean, he was saying uh, the arbitrary decision. He's saying Britain stuck to her end of the deal uh, and pulled out her troops. That's actually not really the case, because they did pull out the troops, but three months later, literally, they invaded Egypt um, in October, and it caused the Suez Crisis. So Britain, France, and uh, Israel uh, invaded Egypt to try and take back control of the Suez Canal. Um, it didn't work out very well, and they had to leave. Uh, yeah, they had to, to leave. By they, you mean the, uh, the, um, the invading forces? Yes, mm. yes. Um, and so after that happened there was this speech by Abdel Nasser. Uh, it's very interesting, so I just wanted to include it here. We'll play the first minute or so. الجمعة اللي فاتت من أربعة أيام في هيئة الإزاعة البريطانية التلفزيون الإنجليزي عامل برنامج عن اليمن اللي هي البي بي سي وبعدين راحوا شاتمين جمال عبد الناصر بالخاص بدي بإحنا كان زمان بيجيبوا مركب هنا يهزوا الحكومة النهارده لما يشتمونا نقدر نضربهم بالجزمه كمان ونشتمهم من اكبر واحد من اقل واحد جابوا الاساطيل حصل ايه؟ ما جابوا الاساطيل هنا بورسعيد هدموهم هل الاساطيل نفعت معانا سنه 56 ولا بتوع المظلات صرفوا 100 مليون جنيه وطلعوا بحسرتهم طلعوا بخيبتهم النهاردة ما قدامهمش إلا إنهم يشتمونا ولا ما بيشتمونا بنشعر إن إحنا ناس مهمين بقى كان زمان جريدة التايمز لما تتكلم كلمة يسقط رئيس وزراء المملكة المصرية النهاردة أما بيشتمونا طب ما إحنا نقدر نشتمهم وإحنا جريدنا ما تقدرش تشتم ملكة بريطانيا ولا رئيس وزراء بريطانيا ممكن أول ما انت شتمتهم هنا كتبت لهم ايه على الحيطه في بورسعيد؟ احنا فاكرين الكلام ده. نجيب لهم الكلام اللي على الحيطه ونطلعه لهم. قلت لهم يورقين دي ايه؟ اوكي سو ذاتس ذا بوينت اي وانت تو جيت ات. يو ماي هاف اي هوب يو جوت ات. سو اسينشلي هي واز سينج 
In the past, Britain being a colonizing force could just, you know, do whatever they want and insult whoever they want. But now they can't. And in fact, you know, if they want to insult us, we can insult them back. And you see here, he said, he asked the people, uh, you wrote on the walls of Port Said, like in graffiti, you know, your queen is a what? And the crowd ans answered them uh, with a uh, insult. <laughs> um, he has a very, uh, I'm sorry to say that, a bit like, uh, reminds me a little bit about Trump. Uh, in a way, like how mm. he worked the... I mean, not the way he speaks, but maybe just the interaction. Mm. Uh, a little bit, I guess. But uh, yeah, I'm not here to <laughs> touch anything. So please don't kill me. No, that's fine. I've never heard... I, like, I haven't heard that comparison before. Uh, but uh, like I said, he is a controversial figure. And uh, most Egyptians feel quite passionately about him. They either passionately love him or hate him. Um, but... Something else that he did that was very interesting has to do with uh, a monument here in Cairo. So this is Cairo, huge city, about 20 million. It's the capital of Egypt and 20 million inhabitants. Um, and one of the very famous monuments in Cairo, besides the pyramids, of course, is the Cairo Tower. This was the tallest structure in Africa when it was built in 1956 for about 10 years. And it remains the tallest structure in Egypt and in North Africa to this day. So the story goes that in 1956, uh, after the Suez Crisis, the U.S. Uh, so a little bit of backstory. Actually, the U.S. helped Egypt get out of the Suez Crisis. Uh, it was this was after World War II, and they were you know becoming the global superpower that they are today. Um, and so they definitely did help Egypt uh, get out of the situation. Mm -hmm. And in return, of course, they were expecting Egypt to you know be on their side. And this was in the middle of the Cold War. Of course, they don't want Egypt to swing towards the Soviet Union. So the story goes that the CIA approached Abdel Nasser and they offered him three million US dollars as a bribe. In return, he would join something called the Middle East Defense Organization, which is just some, I don't really know what it does, but it was a proposed organization that would allow the US to have some more control over the Middle East. And also that he would stop supporting the Algerian revolution, which was going on at the same time against the French. So Abdel Nasser accepted the money, he took it, and with it he built this tower. And it's called the tallest no in history. Uh, and so we can zoom in here. He sort of built it as a message to the US and to the CIA saying, you know, he can't be bought out. Uh, he said, oh, from the tower actually you can see all of Cairo, or almost all of Cairo, and you can also see the pyramids, but unfortunately the pyramids are in that direction. <laughs> And I couldn't find, I couldn't find another view that's the other side. But you can see the, the pyramids if you go there. Um, yeah, and when he built it, he chose this location specifically because he said he wants it to be seen from the American embassy. And guess where the American embassy is? It's right there. So actually, you know, here's the tower. Here's the American embassy. And of course, you're not going to find a street view from the American embassy for security reasons. But uh, in a nearby building well maybe not that near but pretty near for pretty near there's a tower in the reflection there's a tower right there so the tallest known history was built in you know 1956 and to this day you can still see it from the u.s embassy uh which is quite cool nowadays you know people go uh there's a restaurant at the top you can go enjoy the wonderful view uh, sometimes they have some nice lights on it um Every once in a while, somebody jumps off and kills themselves. <laughs> uh, yeah. <clears throat> would you say, um, just curious, like uh, as a tourist, right, would you say this is like a center of Cairo? Or is this like actually a bit off center? Or, mm. or... So the center of Cairo is where we're going right now. Uh -huh. um, maybe geographically, that is the center. Because you'll see it's actually an island. It's called Gzira in Arabic, okay. which literally means island. Uh, and it's... in. You know, the Nile sort of splits here, mm. and you have the Zemelik. And Cairo, yeah, extends this way a little bit, and it extends this way. The pyramids are right here. Oh, okay. Um, but the real sort of center of Cairo is uh, Medan Tahrir, which translates to Liberation Square. Mm -hmm. uh, this is sort of like the heart of Cairo. Mm -hmm. And you can see it's quite massive. Uh, this is the actual the Medan itself. Mm -hmm. Here is the continuation of it. Uh, and all of this is open space. Here is the museum, the Egyptian museum. Oh, 
Is this the one that they move the mummies mm, from? From, okay, yes. okay, okay. So you might have seen recently, the, there was a huge parade, I think called the Pharaoh's Parade. They moved a bunch of mummies from this Egyptian museum to the new Egyptian museum. Let me test my geography skills, <laughs> which is, these are the pyramids right there. This is the new Egyptian museum. Oh. The Grand Egyptian Museum, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's quite nice. I mean, it overlooks the pyramids. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so anyway, Tahrir Square, uh, you may have seen it in the news about 10 years ago during the Egyptian Revolution. Uh, this is what it looks like. Nope. It's always like a technical... Yep. Oh. Yep. Uh, this is no longer there. They replaced it with an, a huge obelisk. But this is what it looks like. Um, there is the Egyptian Museum. Uh, here is the Nile Ritz Carlton, uh, just a hotel. And here is a huge government building, jokingly called the Deep State. So this is so huge. Uh, and so many offices inside. Uh, but nowadays, yeah, so this huge pole flag was replaced with uh, an actual obelisk. Uh, taken from Luxor, I think, or from Aswan. Um, sorry. We need to load it a little bit. But maybe at a, while we are loading the, the pictures, uh, I have a weird question. It's just, um, would let's say for this ob obelisk, um, would like locals, like you or students, you know, young people, would they say, let's meet at the obelisk? Would you actually say that? So meeting in the middle of Tahrir Square is quite inconvenient because it's... <laughs> It's surrounded by like roads, right? So to get to the center, uh, probably not where you would meet. You could meet on like the sides and you would be able to see it. Uh, yeah, you can see here the obelisk and behind it is the government building. Uh, so they just recently moved it, I think. Yeah, so when the, when the picture was taken, there's a cover on it. Uh, but yeah, they removed the cover. It was criticized a little bit because some archaeologists said the pollution from the cars would, you oh. know, cause it to deteriorate. Yeah. Which is fair enough. Um, so they replaced the flagpole after the revolution? No, no, no. The flagpole oh. was there up until they moved this last year. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. But you know, like during the revolution, this is what it looked like. Uh, huge. I mean, there were, you know, the bridge over there and even on the other side, it was filled with hundreds of thousands of people. People were camping in the middle. But it looks very different today. Um you know, not to get into political issues, but it's perhaps harder to organize something similar like mm. this today, uh, maybe out of design. And the flagpole is gone, it's not? Yeah, this was 2011 though. Okay. Yeah. I think the flagpole came after 2011. I'm not sure what was there before. I was like nine years old, so <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know. Too young, but yeah. And you can see the Cairo Tower right there, actually, in the background. Mm. Yeah. Now, another interesting part of Cairo uh, that you probably wouldn't know is called City of the Dead. Uh, this sounds like an ancient Egyptian thing. It's not at all ancient Egyptian. Uh, but it does go way back. So the origins of this little... Well, it's not little at all. Uh, it's a neighborhood. Uh, it's not a neighborhood either. This <laughs> origin of this place is um, dates back to about the 6th century, I would say. Uh, or the 7th century with the start of Islam in Egypt and uh, people would build their tombs here um, so just a little note uh, tombs, Islamic tombs or, yeah, tombs for Muslims are they're built above the ground mm. uh, so it's a structure like a little house and inside the, the tomb sits above the ground usually uh, of course there's some variations regionally and culturally but generally this is how it goes and so over the years uh, people, uh, you know, would bur bury their dead here, common people as well as leaders and icons and religious people and stuff like that. And so besides it being cemeteries, people also started to move in. Uh, there are many mosques here. Uh, I'm going to show you a photo in just a bit and you can see all the minarets, uh, like the tops of the mosque. And you can see on, you know, there's a mosque there, there's a mosque there, another one here, another one here. Uh, so it's completely filled with mosques. So scholars, you know, would also live here to study. But since about 100 years ago, Cairo started to become very overpopulated. And so people just started to move in and live here. So it, part of it has turned into like a slum almost. Mm -hmm. um, I found this photo. 
Oh wait, no, this is before it. This is a picture of a mosque inside, and it has a mausoleum. Uh, so this is a famous figure who died and was buried, and you can sort of visit his tomb. Um, and you'll also see the architecture and the you know the old stones. Uh, it's definitely a very interesting uh, place to go, uh, especially if you know you know the story behind the person who's visit, uh, buried there. So mostly people go to visit a specific person. Uh, it could even be somebody who was in your family, you know, hundreds of years ago. But then also, if you're just living there, you know, this is what it might look like. <laughs> so I found this photo, this is by coincidence. Uh, yeah, you know, no, actually the rest of his face is here. This <laughs> 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 is a nice, you know, friendly Egyptian guy. Uh, you know, very typical, just Egyptian looking people. Uh, having a barbecue. You can see they're making some kofta, it's like some meat oh. on a stick, I guess. And it looks like some shawarma, maybe. Um, on the roof of their house, you know, some red brick buildings, they're not painted. Uh, this is quite a common sight in Egypt, especially in slums. Just enjoying the day, you know. And, and uh, today there's about somewhere between a quarter of a million and a million people living in the city of the dead in Cairo. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them have houses, like you see here. Some of them don't. They literally just live... Inside, mm. uh, okay. So I have to load the uh, pictures mm, a little bit. Yeah, suspense. Yeah, so, yeah suspense. Um, but then the then the question that that comes up again will be: um, Is there any, you know, superstitious that you shouldn't be living near the dead? Uh, I mean, well, I mean, you can see this guy, right? So uh, let me explain this photo. I mean, there's not much explanation. You can see the guy, the cat. So I just noticed literally right now, two tombs, and on the back here it says in Arabic Matfanet Ailet Taha Mustafa. So Taha Mustafa is a name, and Matfanet. So the cemetery or the tomb of the family of Taha Mustafa, uh, and you know here are the tombs. Here is the guy sleeping, um, and here is the cat. So you would think, yeah, you shouldn't live near dead people, maybe. Um, but actually, I think in 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 Egyptian culture, it's not really that. Uh, significant i guess uh, perhaps also there's a religious aspect i know that in islam it's you know um the whole aspect of death is sort of seen more spiritually as in once you die sort of like your your body is borrowed uh, borrowed mm. you know your, mm. your soul is is really you and you're just living in your body in your duration here on earth and mm. when you die you know you belong to god uh and so really this whole stuff about burial and 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 where your body is and cemeteries maybe is not that uh, emphasized mm -hmm. so you get to see stuff like this um yeah interestingly though people would say there's a curse if you go to like an ancient egyptian tomb but not in just a regular tomb <laughs> yeah okay then if you disturb the king then yeah you, you yeah. have a <laughs> curse and uh, uh, uh yeah. but if it's just a normal thing then it's like if just you disturb an everyday person it's fine <laughs> uh nearby you know, you can see this huge contrast. This It's like a concrete uh, jungle almost uh, on all sides of Cairo. But then here is Al Azhar Park. Uh, it's a nice place to go, to go and have a stroll. Um, from certain like vantage points in the park, you can see Cairo. I think in this direction... Oh god. Is it this direction? Okay. <laughs> I think it's this direction. Is uh, the City of the Dead, which I just showed you. Uh, here is the park. Um, over there is the edges of the city and actually uh, there's a sort of a really famous church as well built into a cave, built into the mountain mm -hmm. but I couldn't include it in this presentation and over here you'll see oh, Cairo Citadel so this is the um, Muhammad Ali Mosque uh, the mosque sits inside the citadel and we can get a bit closer yes, here it is so this was built uh, I think around 400 years ago, maybe, or 500 years ago. The citadel is much older than that. Mm. Um, and it has a super interesting history behind it, uh, which I will explain in the end, because it sort of all ties together. Uh, but if you visit this place, you get to go to you know a mosque like this, for example, which is super interesting. Uh, the way... You know, you don't get, uh, I think this sort of style of architecture is not very common, uh, this period, where you have these arcs and you have stuff hanging down from the ceilings. Um, 
if you say it's a 400, 500 years ago, is that during the Ottoman? Uh, yes. Kind, kind of? Uh, is it? So mm-hmm. 500 years ago would be bordering on, on, on the Ottoman period, like mm-hmm. when it just began. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm not sure exactly when this was built, mm-hmm. though. We're kind of around that era. Yeah. Might be a bit earlier. I hope I don't. <laughs> I'm not a historian, by the way. I'm just an engineering student. So if I say something wrong, you know, <laughs> don't hold it against me. Yeah, we, all, we can always fact check again. Like, yeah, uh, definitely. Or, or, or Please Wikipedia. do. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll put it in the, in the comments if there's anything, any mistakes. Yes. Yes. Uh, but I did, you know, do my research. So hopefully there's no inaccuracies. <laughs> um, here is the mosque. And... Another famous mosque, right. Nearby this is called Al Hussein Mosque. So uh, this is a more touristy part of Cairo. This is probably the most touristy thing I'm showing in the whole presentation. Uh, and so Al Hussein was the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, he was beheaded in a war, uh, I don't know, in the seven hundred, like year seven hundred ish. And so after he was killed and beheaded, they sent his head here, and I think they buried it inside this mosque. And sort of around it built this sort of like bizarre uh, bazaar, you know, like you see those uh, oriental markets, you mm-hmm. know. And so this is literally what it is. It's, it's the closest thing you'll find to it in Cairo, definitely. Uh, on the ground. Okay, we'll, <laughs> we'll get to that very soon. Um, another mosque maybe is, what's it called? Oh, Masjid al-Hakim. Uh, Al Hakim was a ruler. This would, this mosque was built one thousand years ago, and you can sort of see the difference uh, in this in the style. You know, it to me it looks maybe not as uh, complicated, mm-hmm. uh, but it's very big. Um, yeah, yeah, simpler structure uh, compared to the uh, the earlier citadel mosque. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and it's not supposed to be like this. I guess this is <laughs> it's, it's Google. It's this Google's is the issue. Yeah. yeah, the mosque is definitely flat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but Al Hussein. So back to Hussein. If at the entrance of it, it has many cafes, uh, some quite famous cafes. Um, here is the mosque. Uh, here's something that kind of looks like Singapore. With the <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even know that this was there. It wasn't there the last time I went. Um, and here's some cafes. And this is where like the street begins. You go in um, like a jungle of people. Um, and if there's one place that you're going to get scammed in Egypt, besides the pyramids, it's going to be this place. <laughs> uh, so maybe go with an Egyptian friend. Uh, go with a tour guide. You know, something like that. Um, and Egypt, you know, is predominantly a Muslim country. So their uh, alcohol isn't, you know, sold. Mm-hmm. But... Instead, people sit in... There's a huge cafe culture. And I've noticed it's not really present in Hong Kong that mm-hmm. so much. Where people sit in, in you know, seats like these, you know, uh, drink tea, drink coffee, smoke shisha, uh, just have fun, play cards or whatever. Um, <clears throat> and they sit outside despite the hot Yeah, but usually cafes are more uh, frequented uh, in the evening oh. after sunset. Yeah. Maybe during the day, people would... Uh, just sit inside, I guess. So that's 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 that's, that's quite uh, that's quite a, a good um, big contrast compared to like let's say in Singapore and Hong Kong where cafes seem like you drink coffee in the early mornings or like you know brunch time, uh, but you are saying that it's mostly frequented in the evenings. Yeah, but I mean like oh like not so hot. Yeah, time. yeah, yeah, exactly. So you'll find people there during the day, but at night is when it starts to really become crowded. Mm. You know, the, especially if there's a football match. Mm. People need to play football. Uh, so if it's a big game, you know, it's going to be super crowded. Uh, so you watch uh, football in a cafe. Yeah. <laughs> Not in a bar. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Yeah. So one good thing to note is like you drink coffee and you, like, you, 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 know, you watch football in a cafe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then maybe before we move on, one last question because it's also like in Ramadan period. Mm. Uh, do the cafes also kind of like close uh, um, during the whole day time until um, the time where you break fast? Mostly, yes, cafes would. Uh, restaurants might not. They can still be open. Not everyone uh, in Egypt fasts, and there are many Christians in Egypt. Mm-hmm. Uh, but cafes, yeah, I mean, they're, 
especially because most of their customer base would be fasting and it's during the day anyway, which is not the busiest time. So I think it makes more sense for them to close. Mm, okay. Maybe a few would be open. Uh, yeah. Mm, okay. um, so this is what like a, a street inside would look like. You see here uh, some vendors selling clothes over there. Um, I don't know, some, some stuff. Souvenirs, probably. Some souvenirs. Um, here are some lanterns, especially during Ramadan. There's so many lanterns being sold. Uh, some traditional clothes. What what is the significance of uh, lanterns to for Ramadan? That's a good question, actually. <laughs> uh, the lantern. So one of the symbol, one of the things that are used to symbolize Islam is the crescent moon. Mm. So the lantern of Ramadan kind of uh, has mm, the yeah. uh, sort of that geometry built into it, and ah, uh, okay, okay. I don't know if there's like any special significance okay. to it. Yeah, but it is very common during that time. Mm. Here's another, right, so here you can see this is some cafes uh, that are super popular. Uh, and again, more lanterns, um, more people sitting down. So if you do find yourself in a place like this and you do sit down, you might want to eat this. Uh, this is the only food item I've included in this presentation, unfortunately, but if you should eat it. It's called Umm Ali, and Umm Ali literally translates to Ali's mother. Uh, Ali is just the name. Um means mother, so Ali's mother, literally. Uh, it's sometimes in English they call it like a bread pudding because it has uh, like thin layers of bread and milk and then some sugar and some uh, like nuts and raisins and stuff. Yeah, and this has a very interesting story to it. So at risk of taking a little bit extra time, I would like to explain yeah. the story. So I mentioned earlier Muhammad Ali. He has a story, right? So this is a story, and it ties to Um Ali in the end, but not in the way you think it does. So the Ali here is not the same as the Ali. In no, the Ali's mother. Exactly. Yeah. It's not this Ali. This guy lived way later. So he lived around the early 1800s. He was an extremely important ruler in Egypt and he sort of is said to have modernized Egypt. Right. And he was an Ottoman ruler. In fact, he's Albanian. He's not Egyptian. Really? Yeah. And so Muhammad Ali uh, belongs to the Ottomans, like I said. The Ottomans came after an earlier dynasty called the Mam Mamluks. Okay. And so what happened was in 1811, uh, even though the Mamluks were no longer ruling, they still uh, did, uh, there were still some left in Egypt, uh, and they had a lot of property and they had some influence. So Muhammad Ali sort of, you know, got tired of this and wanted to end them once and for all. So in 1811, he invited 470 of their leaders to his citadel uh, for a huge feast, a huge banquet. Uh, and what happened was, this, you know, the story goes that he... Uh, as they were entering, they went through a corridor and then the guards closed the doors on both sides and they killed all of them. Uh, it's said that one person escaped and he jumped off the top of the citadel, uh, which the citadel sits on a cliff. So he fell from the citadel and from the cliff from his, with his horse. The horse died and he lived and he went to Syria. And that's just a tangent story. Um, yeah. So the Mamluks came at around 1250 AD. Their first leader of the Mamluks, his name was Sultan Aybak. Okay, this is a uh, modern rendering of his face. <laughs> it's like a civ civ civilization game. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, probably not very accurate, but just, you know, so we can keep track of who's who. Um, this is important, right? So he was the founding Sultan of the Mamluk dynasty. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have to introduce one more dynasty, which is... Sorry, should we... <laughs> Okay. Yes, that's the problem with... Uh, it's okay, yeah, it's okay. Let me okay. just recap. Yeah, okay. yeah, recap so Muhammad Ali audience. killed the Mamluks in the 1800s. 600 years earlier, the start of the Mamluks, you had this guy, Sultan Aybak. Okay? Yes. So, I, like I said, he was the founding Sultan. Okay? Before him was the Ayyubid dynasty. So, when uh, in 1250, the king of this dynasty was killed in a crusade, the Seventh Crusade. Uh, and so after he died, his wife became the queen or the sultana. Okay, her name is Shajr al Um <clears throat> So she became the ruler of Egypt during a very tumultuous time. And it was, uh, you know, a difficult time to be ruler. Mm. And she's also has so many stories surrounding her. And she's a very uh, impressive person, uh, definitely. But at the same time, there was growing threats 
to her own rule mm-hmm. from the Mamluks. She herself was not a Mamluk. Mamluk, they come from like the Turkic regions over here. Okay. So to cement her own rule, she married this guy. And this is how he became the first Sultan. So they got married. Her, you can see, I tried to include some, uh, you know, the crown here is big. She had lots of power. The crown here gets a bit smaller. Power is shrinking. Uh, and his power becomes a bit equal. But then there's a problem because he's actually married already. He had another wife. Uh, again, these uh, <laughs> pictures are not accurate. Uh, just for your, you know, information. Uh, your yes, and she has no power. She has no power. She's just his wife. Uh, you know, she has the power as a, a strong, independent woman. Maybe not very independent <laughs> at the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, so of course this causes some issues. Uh, she does not like the fact that her husband just married another woman, mm. and Shazratador, the queen, does not like her either. In fact, she would constantly tell the sultan to divorce her and to stay away from her and stuff like that. Uh, over time, you know, the tensions grew. Shazratador started to lose more of her power, and this guy, the sultan, became even more powerful. And then something happened in 1257. He married another woman. <laughs> okay. This was a political marriage. Uh, there was a growing threat coming from the east. So to sort of cement his place, he married the opposition uh, king. He married her, his daughter, I mean. The daughter of the opposition's king. Right? Uh, and Sojur Dur saw this as a betrayal. Uh, not only because her husband just married another woman, but because she as a leader, you know, she's yeah. losing her power and her influence. And you can see her crown is quite small. <laughs> Uh, so what does she do? She kills him. In 1257, she orders her servants to kill him while he's taking a bath. Mm-hmm. Um, this does not sit well with his first wife, who kills her back. Uh, and she kills her with wooden slippers. <laughs> it's called the Ob'eb in Arabic. Literally, it's a wooden slipper. You find it to this day. If you go to a mosque and somebody steals your slippers, because you're not allowed to enter with your slipper, mm. they'll give you something like this. Um, yes. So this, I, really, I think everybody knows this part of the story in Egypt, but they don't know the, the full story. Talk about a strong woman. Exactly, yeah. So th- some people say she killed her herself. Some people say she got her servants to do it. Uh, it was quite gruesome. Imagine being killed with slippers, literally beaten <laughs> to death by his slippers. I mean, it can't be a nice thing, right? Um, so she celebrates and she's happy. But you know, who is this woman, right? So I never said her name. Well, here's a surprise. She's Omali. Okay, <laughs> her son's name is Ali, so that would make her Umm Ali. Uh, and when she killed Shazrat Dur, out of celebration, she decided she was, you know, this is a time to celebrate. So she's going to pass out a dessert to the common people. This dessert would be made out of bread and milk and some, you know, sugar and sweets and stuff like that. And that's how we got Umm Ali. <laughs> Actually, and... A little bit even more of some folklore. They say if you find a piece of hair inside your umali, then it belongs to Sojur uh, Dur, the lady who, uh, was, who, was murdered. who was murdered by some slippers. Um, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this. It's a bit NSFW. But if you find a raisin, and they do put raisins, it's meant to symbolize uh, certain body parts of Sojur <laughs> Dur uh, as well. Because <laughs> it's said that Umm Ali promised she would slice her up and put her inside. Uh, this this is li- this is literally like the Egypt. I mean, uh, for those of us who are from Hong Kong or like in the in the Chinese culture, we always have these uh, horror stories about like a uh, human pork bun. Uh, this is literally like the Egyptian version of a uh, kind yeah. of like making you know hair and like uh, uh, the body parts into. A- yeah, I mean, I can't tell you how much of it is fact and how much of it is fiction. But, and there's many different versions of the story. Mm-hmm. Some people say Shazur Tador, for example, was thrown off the roof of the building and she was left, you know, three days outside. Uh, yeah, there's many different versions. But the version that relates to this dessert <laughs> is, is this story. So definitely, I would highly recommend it. It's an Egyptian dessert. Uh, yeah. Wow, so this is actually really interesting because it like uh, uh, the next time if I actually really can eat Um Ali, Um Ali, I will be reminded of your story. Exactly, I hope so. Historical, come, pretty gruesome story. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's something that's been around for 800 years, you know, and it started with the death of two women, a man, and a bunch of servants mm. who were executed after. And it's such a good storytelling skill to like revealing at the end who um ali, um ali is. actually is uh yeah. before uh we, we do have two questions from the audience um mm-hmm. maybe we can also um, um 
answer that before we end the tour. Uh, that's first from Nicholas that says, uh, just curious, aside from Cairo, are there other cities you would recommend to visit for someone who has never been to Egypt? Um, yes, definitely. Uh, so, uh, you know, I wanted to include so many more things here, but uh, time is of mm. the essence. Uh, Alexandria. Alexandria mm. is over here. This is a city I was born in. It's a city by the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, so I would definitely recommend going there. Also in the... Oh, sorry. And that is where we have the uh, wonders of the world, right? The, uh, the light, lighthouse. Well, it used to be, of, yeah. Uh, it uh, was destroyed you know, a long time ago. Yeah. The library was also there. And the library of Alexandria. Yeah, it's, def- it's a wonderful place. Uh, yeah, and you, I would also recommend going to this, if you go to the south of Egypt, to Aswan. No, that's Sudan. Wait, where are we? Asw- <laughs> <laughs> wrong country, man. <laughs> wrong country. Here, Aswan, you know, especially if you're interested in pharaonic Egypt, there's so many, uh, there's a saying, uh, not sure how accurate it is, but that two thirds of the world's artifacts are found here. Um, Maybe not that accurate, but... And Luxor as well. So these are the really the historic cities. I wanted to include in this presentation also uh, Siwa, which is right here. It's an oasis. Uh, these are salt lakes. Uh, super, you know, blue, nice lakes. Um, yeah, hope that gives you some motivation. But from... from uh, maybe also just to... Um... Well, Edwin also asked the same, uh, well, a similar question, which is like uh, the place that you enjoyed visiting. Uh, but before I answer that question, how, how, far, how far would Ky- would this uh, Siwa Lake be from Cairo? Let's say, mm. you probably don't have a plane, right? Um, so or... they're building an airport. They're, they don't yet have an airport. Mm-hmm. So the main ways to go are by car and by bus. So if, and I did this trip last year, actually. Uh, Cairo is here. Um, yeah, that's Cairo. And... You, have, you can't go like that. You can't go through the desert, right? Mm. So you actually have to go up almost to Alexandria, then go left. So along uh, the let's coast. Let's make this screen a little bit yeah. bigger. Yeah. yeah. Uh, exactly. So you go up and then uh, cross the coast and then you go back down. It takes about... Depends on who's driving. With my dad, <laughs> it takes like eight hours. And my mom, maybe 12. <laughs> <laughs> and if you take a bus, it'll definitely take longer. Yeah. But from Cairo to Alexandria, it's like two hours... Uh, from Cairo to Aswan, you can drive it, you can take a plane, you can take a train, overnight train. Mm -hmm. And then to go to Sinai, um, also a couple of hours, but especially there's a waiting time to cross the Suez Canal, Mm. because lots of uh, security checks. Oh, to cross the canal? Underground, yeah, for cars. Uh, Because Sinai is maybe northern Sinai, and perhaps not the safest place in the world, uh, there is some you know, terrorist activity a little bit, oh, especially right here. <laughs> this town's city is quite famous, it's called Arif. Uh, it's very near, you see here, like the Gaza. Uh, and yeah, so there's a lot of security checks here. Mm. Right, because of all the uh, 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 no, historical uh, like uh, reasons as well. Yeah, Israel definitely. And the stuff. Um, so we do have, uh, we have a few comments also. Thanks, uh, Ariana. <laughs> yes. Ariana is, is here with us. Yeah. Thank you. Morte bene. Yeah. Grazie. And, uh, and Heidi says, thanks for the intriguing talk. Hope to visit, uh, visit uh, uh, Egypt soon. Um, I know everyone is different, but are there any general characteristics of Egyptians? Well, as you can tell, Egyptians are quite funny. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Egyptians are quite funny, though. I would say I'm not a very funny Egyptian, uh, but Egyptians are funny. Uh, we have a nice sense of humor, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, e- Egyptians speak Arabic. Arabic uh, has many dialects, and the Egyptian dialect of Arabic is probably the most well-known one across the Middle East. Uh, and so, lots of Arab speakers will be able to understand Egyptians and understand their humor. Um, I don't know. Egyptians are also late. To- I don't know. They don't arrive on time. Uh, I arrived here on time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah maybe in driving a bit crazy. Uh, <laughs> I People get surprised when I tell them I've been driving. I don't have a license, but I've been driving for six years. And I'm 19. So I've been driving for a while. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. It's on YouTube. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's okay. Um, yeah, so it's... You enjoy it. You should definitely go to YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> It's a nice place. I see, I see. Uh, but if there's one thing I think we can, um, we, 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 to end off this session, um, I myself, as a non-Egyptian, as someone who's never been to Egypt, after hearing from your sharing, um, it's, it's, it opens up really a whole new world um, from what I st- 
always thought of Egypt to be just dry sand, the Nile and pyramids, but you have told me so much more things about uh now my my mind is stuck with Omali. <laughs> Of course, of course, they are the city of the day and uh, yeah. and all the uh, beautiful um, scenes. And just in case, I think for everyone who has not noticed, we have uh, basically I've not shown you a single uh, picture of, of pyramids as mm. we promised, <laughs> right? Yes. So uh, if you're watching this on live or if you're watching this later on, um, or if you have any questions to um, to uh, Serak about you know other traveling tips. Uh, feel free to uh, comment in the YouTube or you can also find us on uh, our social media and um, so it's just for Instagram it's intercultural education or Facebook as the eyes Hong Kong um, and uh, maybe last words from you like as a Egyptian to promote Egyptian tourism uh, in case your consular is also looking you know, yeah like, oh uh, okay <laughs> I hope they're looking because I'm trying to oh yeah never mind <laughs> but um, <clears throat> yeah so I mean really I wasn't uh, making this with the intent of promoting uh, tourism. I, honestly, I think Egypt does fine enough promoting its own tourism. And if you go online, you'll find so many videos, mm -hmm. you know, really well-made videos uh, showing Egypt in so many different angles. And it's always, you know, quite beautiful and quite well-made. Um, I just felt like as a person who enjoys traveling as well, uh, tra travel doesn't have as much value if there's no, if you don't understand what it is you're seeing and why it's significant and you know, what went into it being there, uh, you know. So when I like to, when I travel and when I visit places, I always like to know the story behind, you know, these artifacts and these sites. So that's just what I wanted to share with all of you guys. Uh, and I hope, you know, you learned something. I hope you remember some of the stories, uh, whether it's Omali or you remember like the story of the Rosetta Stone or Dahab or Mount Sinai. Uh, you know, Egypt is just filled with stories. It's, you know, it has a history of like 7,000 years and the pharaohs and the pyramids are a huge part of it but you know if you even erase all of that it's probably still one of the richest histories in the world yeah. so uh, yeah definitely yeah. so if you guys have the uh, chance feel free uh, after covid uh, do visit the lovely country of egypt yes. and with that they say thank you so much uh and i hope to see you guys uh, soon um we are gonna have our next uh, explorers months uh, which i'll keep the country a secret for now right but still please keep uh you know following our instagram uh we, go, we have a few more uh, posts about egypt coming up all right so if you want to learn about uh, this uh, this beautiful country um you can do so also on our instagram and facebook but with that to say thank you so much and uh have a good day um well, how do you say goodbye in salam salam all right salam, salam and thank you <laughs>